So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Diego Avente Brand. I am the director of Latin American Studies program here at the Elio School of International Affairs, uh, GW. It is a pleasure to uh, co sponsor with the Humanitarian Action Initiative this very, very important and timely panel discussion on the humanitarian and political crisis in Haiti. About a month ago in mid-August, Haiti was struck by a 7.2 magnitude earthquake that devastated the southwestern part of the country and then tropical storm Grace. These uh, two events took place at the same time that Haiti was undergoing a period of political instability caused by persistent gang violence, massive protest against President Jovenel Moise, and then the assassination of the president a, a, a little bit earlier in July. The estimations are that the, now there are 600,000 individual Haitians in need of humanitarian assistance. And relief efforts have been slowed by uh, infrastructure problems, impossible roads, mudslides, uh, and also by gang violence. In spite of this, uh, locally led community groups, many forms uh, after the uh, 2010 earthquake, are providing assistance, some of the some of the heads of these groups are here with us. Uh, we know that previous interventions and uh, involving organizations, especially MINUSTA, uh, the American Red Cross and OCFAM, OCFAM I'm sorry, uh, develop a deep mistrust of the role that external actors could play in these uh, situations and complicated uh, and is complicated relief. So this is further destabilizing the political, the very fragile political and economic system in Haiti. Just recently, we read, for example, the, the accusation of the prosecutor against the prime minister who is being accused of being involved or having been involved in some way in the assassination of President Moise, then the prime minister ended up removing the prosecutor. So we're really going through a process of political crisis that is making the humanitarian crisis even, even more acute and worried. So this is an appropriate time for us to discuss this, to try to understand the causes, and at the same time to generate a support, political support for a, especially the United States and others, other countries, to get involved in a more active and helpful way in assisting the Haitian population. We're very uh, fortunate to have with us a very distinguished academics as well as activists. Uh, I will briefly present each one of them uh, first and then give the give them uh, the microphone for their presentation in the order in which they're gonna speak. So first, uh, Professor Alicia Goldstein Seppingwall. Uh, she's a professor of history at the uh, California State University, San Marcos. Uh, she has a BA in intellectual history and political, political uh, philosophy at the, at the University of Pennsylvania and a master and PhD at, from Stanford. And she's uh, doing research, especially on the French and Haitian revolution and modern Haitian history, slavery, uh, uh, films on uh, French colonialism, French Jewish history, etc. We also have Professor Jean-Eddy Saint-Paul, uh, 
a, a professor of sociology and former founding director of the CUNY Haitian Studies Institute at Brooklyn College. Professor St. Paul uh, holds a Master of Art in Latin American Studies from the Pontificia Universidad Javeriana uh, in Bogotá and a PhD in Sociology from El Colegio de Mexico. Uh, the first Haitian to do so since the foundation of this very prestigious institution in 1940. We also have Cecile Asilian. Uh, I'm not sure whether she's already here with us, is a widely published professor and chair of the Interdisciplinary Studies Department at Kennesaw University uh, in Georgia. Uh, she uh, studies especially Francophone Africa and Caribbean literature and cultures and film and media studies. Uh, we have with us Luin, Luino Hobi, Hobi Yar, uh, is an expert in community driven social change across Haiti. He is a co founder of the Convict Soleil Left movement, uh, which brings together the different blocks of the Cite Soleil for positive social change. He has led many initiatives uh, to document and support community driven changes throughout Haiti. Uh, especially in the areas of peace building and environmental empowerment. Uh, finally, we have Emanuela Duyon. Emanuela is the founder of Policite, a consulting firm and think tank that focuses on economic development. Ms. Duyon is an economist and a leader of the Petro Challenger and New Pap Domi social movement, demanding working to promote greater government accountability, accountability and transparency. I've been very brief in introducing our guest speakers uh, in the interest of time. I will not introduce my dear colleague, uh, Marian Delofre. She is the head of the, uh, I mean, the Humanitarian Action Initiative here at uh, at the Elliott School in <clears throat> GW, and she was actually the driving force uh, or in, in organizing this most timely and relevant event. So welcome everybody. Uh, I will start by giving the microphone to Professor Colstein Seppingwald. And I, I will mute my, my, my uh, I will mute myself and I want to suggest everybody mute so that we don't have, we have a better sound for the audience attending this event. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me, Professor Delof and Professor Benti Brun. Um, and thank you so much to Brianna. And thanks to all of you who are here today in the audience. It's really an honor to speak alongside um, these colleagues of mine. And normally I would like to speak after them and to second what they said, but since I am going first in this order, um, I will say that I try to work in collaboration with Haitians. And so I hope that what I'm saying um, is something that um, my Haitian colleagues would support. So the question that we were asked is how to ensure stability in Haiti. And I'm the historian on this panel. So I'd, I'd like to give a little bit of a historical perspective and I, I uh, want to get across one main message, which is that the path to achieve a stable future in Haiti is to allow Haitians to have real sovereignty. Um, there's kind of a fiction of Haitian sovereignty, and I want to explain what I mean. And this is something that's been going on for more than a century. We, meaning the U.S. and the international community, really have not been allowing Haitians to choose their own leaders. And when they do, we are quick to interfere. So many Americans, when they are looking at the instability in Haiti, do not realize our role in fomenting it. Um, so I have a quote for you as a historian, even from 1893. This is Frederick Douglass. And he declared, Haiti has all the conditions essential to a noble, prosperous, and happy country. Yet, 
There she is, torn and rent by revolutions, by clamorous factions and anarchies. And then he mentioned Haitian elites opposed to the interest of the Haitian masses and added, they have allies in the United States. Men in high American quarters have boasted to me of their ability to start a revolution in Haiti at their pleasure. So that quotes from 1893. Douglas also warned that the US had strategic designs on Haiti and that we needed not to interfere in our neighbor's sovereignty. But sure enough, in 1915, both to ensure that we would control Haiti rather than maybe the Germans and to capture Haitian customs revenues for American banks, the Marines invaded Haiti on July 28th, 1915. They used as a pretext the assassination of a Haitian president, Villebrun Guillaume Sam. Um, but of course, the Marines were already docked in port waiting for something similar to happen. Indeed, as the US civil rights leader, James Weldon Johnson wrote in the nation, quote, the overthrow of Guillaume did not constitute the cause of American intervention in Haiti, but merely furnished the awaited opportunity. So though we claimed that we were there to create stability, we remained in Haiti 20 years and created more instability. In theory, Haitians still ruled themselves, but we installed figurehead presidents while forcing Haitians to build roads for the US or work on sugar plantations for American companies and also forced a rewrite of the Haitian constitution, which allowed foreigners to buy up land in Haiti, something that had been forbidden under the 1805 constitution. So during the US occupation, Haitian sovereignty was clearly fictional. The US was in charge. But even after we left in 1934, I would argue that did not fully change. Even without boots on the ground, the threat remained that if Haitian leaders did something that the US did not like, either an assassination could be arranged or the Marines would return once again. So the threat of American invasion is something that is always in the background. And it's been clear to Haitian leaders from the 1930s through to the 2020s that if they adopt policies contrary to the interests of the US, they risk a new military occupation. Uh, indeed, we helped the Duvalier dictatorship stay in power despite its brutality, because they were anti-communists and they promised the US that they would prevent Haiti from going the way of Cuba. And in 1991, even as the US spoke of spreading democracy around the world, Haitian military officials who were on the CIA payroll affected a coup against elected President Jean-Bertrand Aristide when his policies threatened foreign profits as well as the interests of Haitian elites. Um, and then this behavior was repeated in 2004 when US Marines, once again, under a pretext of creating order, were sent to remove Aristide from power in a second coup. So since then, as the Atlantic explained, uh, based on diplomatic cables that were uncovered by WikiLeaks, quote, America has been micromanaging and manhandling the Haitian government into aligning their policies with US interests. So those patterns have sadly continued into the 2010s and now. In 2011, right after the catastrophic earthquake, the international community pressured Haitian leader Rene Preval into holding an election, even though most Haitians were displaced and could not get to their polling places. So after an election where less than 23% of registered voters were able to vote. Um, Michelle Martelli of the party that's called the PHTK, which I'm sure my colleagues will talk more about, um, was put in power. However, this is an election that is widely seen as having been um, engineered by the international community. In fact, Ricardo Seitenfus, a former OAS special representative in Haiti, complained of the, quote, silent coup d'etat that his colleagues had conducted against Haitians 
under MINISTA occupation enforcing Michel Martelly on Haitians. So since that time, since 2011, the international community has continued to support the PHTK, which is the current party now under Ariel Henry, despite the misery it has been inflicting on Haitians. Just to go very quickly to the present, which my colleagues will talk about more, during protests that began in 2018, the US and UN continued to prop up the PHTK. And in February, 2021, when Jovenel Moise's term ended, according to Haitian jurists, and Haitians massed in the streets to protest, the US State Department continued to prop him up and arm him against his own people. Um, and as the Biden administration continued this policy that had been started by the Obama administration and continued under the last, there were protests from members of Congress who saw that this policy of supporting the PHTK would not lead to stability. In April, 2021, representatives Gregory Meeks, chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and Hakeem Jeffries, chairman of the House Democratic Caucus. So this is in April before the assassination. They sent a letter with more than 60 colleagues to Secretary of State Anthony Blinken urging the United States to change its policies in Haiti. And in late June, 2021, again, week before the assassination of Jovenel Moise, the House Foreign Affairs Committee sent a bipartisan letter, the Democrats and Republicans, pointing to Moise's authoritarian tendencies and urging us to support Haitian civil society. So sadly, we did not do that and we still are not. The last thing I will say is that I can continue in questions, but the number one thing that I think we can do to ensure stability now is to withdraw support for the PHTK, which is ruling illegally, and they allow a transition um, alongside Haitian civil society and the commission, the Commission de la Société Civile Haitienne, the Haitian Civil Society Commission, um, and I will tell you that in Congress, Representative Andy Levin and the House Haiti Caucus have been pushing us to recognize them um, in rebuilding a real democratic government that can do what people want rather than being ruled by this party. So I'll end there and I look forward to the comments from my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Goldstein, setting one for this wonderful overall historical. A overview of the political process in Haiti that allow us to better understand uh, where we are right now and the challenges we face. Now it's my pleasure to give the mic to Professor Jean Edi Sampo uh, for his presentation. Um, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. It's such a great pleasure uh, to share this virtual space with some, you know, new colleagues and all, all, all colleagues all together friends so thank you so much for the invitation so in in my opening remarks so i will explore i'm a sociologist and i do social theory so i will explore the connection between you know um political crisis and humanitarian crisis in haiti and one of my important contribution if i can call it contribution today will to inform uh, you guys that the contrary to the notion of political crisis that has a very long important history uh, in the political um, arena in Haiti, the concept of humanitarian crisis is a recent invention. And it is an invention uh, with based on what we call in sociology an instrumental rationality. So it's an invention that we cannot understand without scrutinizing, for instance, the negative impact of neoliberal policies that have been implemented in Haiti. So neoliberal policies is a process that have been implemented in Haiti um, be, uh, at the beginning of the 1980s. So I would like you to see humanitarian action as a consequences of something else. So this is what I will, I wanted to talk in my, um, you know, opening remarks. So 
Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to share this virtual platform with all of you. Thank you so much for the invitation. So um, in, let me first start by informing you that the title of my opening remark is uh, Political and Humanitarian Crisis in Haiti, an Analytical Approach. Contrary to the notion of political crisis that has a long history in Haiti's political lexicography, the term humanitarian crisis is relatively new in the political arena in the Caribbean island. Humanitarian crisis is an invention of the agencies of the United Nations to legitimize the need for foreign intervention of nonprofits and powerful international NGO with headquarters in the global north and more specifically in Geneva and Washington DC. An NGO that makes their fortune in the precarity of conditions, but precarity of conditions that were created uh, you know, in this sort by powerful organization located in the global north. Um, a critical assessment of politics in Haiti, at least from the beginning of the 1980s to now, to now authorize me to point out that humanitarian crises in countries such as Haiti is the consequences of bad political decision made by local politicians, but local politicians coerced by powerful social forces uh, from the international community. And recently I published an article in the Georgetown Journal of International Affairs in which I explain, you know, the configuration of those uh, powerful external forces, right? So you can check out my article. So political instability, for instance, is a prerequisite or a precondition for creating a social atmosphere uh, propitious for external humanitarian action. In 1997, the sociologist Sauveur Pierre Etienne published his first book uh, under the title Haiti, l'invasion des ONG, Haiti, the invasion of NGO, in which Sauveur Pierre Etienne alerted of the danger of the growing number of NGOs that are invading Haiti. It was after uh, the publication of that book that the media will start to talk more and more uh, about Haiti, but portrayed as a country that is facing a humanitarian crisis. Here, there are two important things that we have to know. First, humanitarian crisis, as I said earlier, has a history in Haiti, and that history is deeply connected to the process of invention, invasion of NGO. To say it in other words, the notion of humanitarian crisis as the concept of ghetto, for instance, is an external fabrication imposed in the Haitian society by international institution and NGO to justify their modes of intervention in Haiti, presented as a country that is immersed into a deep crisis and that only, only international humanitarian institution can help out. Uh, accordingly, humanitarian crisis is a concept invented in a broader context in which the international community has been using Haiti as a clinical case or a, a car clinic, or if you want an open laboratory that responds to the new logic of international division of labor in the global society. The second core idea that is important to underscore for a better understanding of today's panel discussion is that without an important diagnosis of the impact of neoliberalism in the region, it will be impossible to comprehend the making of Haiti as a clinical case for humanitarian action. I was personally born in Torbeck. Torbeck is a rural section near Le Kai. My dad was a farmer. The farmer, including my dad, dedicated their life to agriculture. 
they had their cattle, including Creole pigs. The Haitian farmer used to, so, to sell their uh, cattle, their Creole pig, to, sell, to solve their family's problems, such as paying the tuition of their kids, buy new tissue for the school uniform. When I was going in Torbeck in the beginning of the 1980s, for instance, I also experienced hurricane, such as the hurricane Allen, that in 1980s caused approximately 200 deaths in the region of Lekai. But in 1980s, the farmers in Haiti were able to rebuild their house without the help of international NGO. We didn't hear back then that Haiti need tents, blanket, water bottle, and the like. I never heard the farmer mention that they were facing a crisis that required external, ex, external humanitarian action. However, during the presidency of Ronald Reagan, the Haitian farmer in Haiti will be confronted to serious problems. The paper debt, that is the program to eradicate African swine fever and to develop pig raising, destroy the Creole pigs in Haiti. The Creole pig back then represent the saving account of the Haitian farmer. Organizations such as the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United States, the International Development Bank, and the Inter-American Institute for Scientific Agriculture, IICA, or El Instituto IICA, a branch of the OAS, were behind that program, which is the pay for debt. Of course, the Creole pig of Haiti were soon replaced by pig coming from the United States of America. And since then, the Haitian farmer has lost a huge amount of their dignity. Another data, historical data. Always during Ronald Reagan's presidency, the Haitian farmer will be among the victims of the Caribbean Basin Recovery Act, better known as CBI, a, an initiative launched in 1983 by the Reagan administration and implemented in Haiti via the USAID, the United States Agency for International Development. Under the auspices of the CBI, the USAID reviewed and recommended Haitian government to change the laws, regulation, and policies that govern business operation in the Caribbean region. Haitian politicians like Henri Nanfi and Chicago boys economists like Leslie Delato, through the CBI, started the dismantling of the public sector. The Emeritus Wesleyan University sociology professor Alex Dupuis wrote that, and I quote, the CBI was designed to dismantle as far as possible the public sector and importation substitution industry in those economies and replace them with private enterprise owned either locally by foreign investors or by joint ventures, uh, end of quote. That process of neoliberalization for me of the Haitian economy will continue throughout Haiti political transition toward representative liberal democracy. It was that same logic of neoliberalization of the Haitian economy that explained the interference of the US State Department in the 2010-2011 presidential election when U.S. State Secretary of State, Madame Hillary Rodham Clinton, picked Michel Joseph Martelly, a musician of dubious morality, over Madame Mirland Hippolyte Maniga, a PhD, a college professor, and a leading expert in constitutional law in the, in the country. The slogan, Haiti is open for business, launched by President Michel Martelly, and approved by the US Department of State was inscribed into the logic of continuity of the CBI in Haiti, a, 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 a policy that requires the destruction of traditional industry, massive privat privatization of public institutions, structural adjustment policy, deregulation of the economy, 
why they value in the national currency, as well as the opening of the local economy to foreign investment by lowering business taxes. It was from that logic that we, sorry. Oh, okay, it was in, uh, okay, I'm about to, to end. It was in that logic, it was in that logic, we have to interpret the political propaganda of politicians like Michel Martelly and former prime minister, Laurent Salvador Lamotte, who claimed that Haiti was open for business. Those neoliberal policy, as Professor Alex Dupuy pointed out, have helped to transfer the wealth of from the poor to the rich and have increased inequality in Haitian society. As conclusion, as a result, Haiti as a country and the Haitian farmer, nowadays they are very vulnerable to any natural catastrophe, hurricane, earthquake, etc. I think that context is very important to understand why now we are talking about humanitarian crisis in Haiti. Haiti was not always a country in search of humanitarian action. There are certain political conditions that have been created to make Haiti very suitable for humanitarian crisis that requires humanitarian, external humanitarian action. Thank you. And we can continue that conversation to your QA. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor St. Paul, for this very enlightening presentation addressing the issue both of NGOs as well as the destabilizing uh, impact or consequences of the external intervention. It is my pleasure now to introduce Professor Cecilia Silian. Uh, you have the mic. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, um, Professor Aben de Bruan, um, Professor Delof, and um, I have been in communication with um, um, we are an adult, so thank you for putting this together. I'll be brief. I have one and a half page, so make sure I'm I'm brief because um, Jean Edzi stole my time. Um, I've been thinking about that question that uh, you ask about what is the path to achieve a stable future, and in my attempt to have some thoughts on the question, I have more questions. I'm sure many of you saw today's Washington Post headlines that read, thousands of Haitian migrants wait under the bridge in South Texas after mass crossing, and there's pictures of people crossing the river. I wonder what images will have accompanied this headline if this story was not about Haiti. I wonder whether the headlines will have perhaps say something along the line, quote, Several Haitians are seeking for a better life in the US. How is migration connected to history, access to resources and instability? What exactly do we mean by a stable future? Stable future for whom? Who are the actors and stakeholders? And who will determine what that looks like? For me, in my view, in order for Haiti to achieve a powerful, stable future, we need to look at the past, get some lessons, and see how we can reshape the narratives about Haiti. Not just the narrative in terms of words, but the narratives in terms of actions, sustainability, and equality. Furthermore, this stable future must be imagined in the context of intersectionalities, of the identities of all Haitians, rural versus urban, materialistically well off the 2% versus the rest of the population, the youth versus the older population. 50% of the population in Haiti is younger than 25 years old, and many do not have historical memory as it relates to Haitian politics. How does gender play into it? Women are triply marginalized. In terms of their gender, they lack unequal access to education, on, they have ongoing economic instability and ongoing gender-based violence. The whole gang situation in Haiti 
impact women tremendously more and at higher rates than it impact men. Over 74% of women's income comes from the informal economy, agriculture, commerce, et cetera. And I believe it's more than 74% in my opinion. My answer to the question continues with even more questions. Who are the actors who are currently holding and creating the primary narratives? Those actors are in Washington, France, Canada, Haiti, Miami, et cetera. What are their positionalities in terms of gender, class, nationality? What is the power dynamic among the many actors? What should be the role of the diaspora in shaping this stable future? The following major issues must be resolved to achieve a stable future, and I'm concluding. There must be security in terms of food, health, well-being, violence against women, education, true and equal access to education for everyone from K to 12 and for four years of college. There must be adequate health care. There must be citizenship. There must be a decentralization of Haiti. It's as if poor press, then the rest of the country. There must be a politics of inclusion where all Haitians from all walks of life fully participate in the country's decision. In order to do that, Haitians must be at the center of all decisions that affect them, whether rebuilding efforts, elections, distribution of funds, education, healthcare, et cetera. Until this happens, the question posed by some colleagues will remain, who owns Haiti? This was the title of a 2017 collection of essay co-edited by Scott Freeman and Robert McGuire. As my colleague Alisa pointed out earlier, the past influences the present and future. In what language will this new narrative um, be created? Will it be in Creole, French, English, a combination? Lastly, who will be allowed to have a seat at the table to create these narratives? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Asilien, uh, for your very uh, clear presentation. Um, the pre prerequisite uh, for a path to a stable Haiti and uh, the, the important role of this intersectional approach, intersectionality, uh, not only as a principle, but also uh, as, a, as a challenge. Uh, and you mentioned, I'm very glad to, to mention here at this point that Professor Maguire is also participating in this, in this event. I saw him in, uh, among our attendees uh, together with uh, Professor Patricia Cerebi, who is also a professor of history dealing with the issues of race, but in this case, mainly in Brazil. So welcome, Professor Maguire and Professor Acerbi. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Luino Hobi Hobia. Uh, the microphone is yours. I believe you're going to be speaking in Creole. And uh, I think Sabina will be helping us with uh, the translation. Thank you, thank you very much for the for the invitation. So, thank you, thank you to allow that to speak in Creole because when we're talking about you know very deep hey in Haiti, so I prefer to speak in my own language Creole uh, to better communicate. So thank you, Sabina, for helping out with the translation. Um, Uncle Messi, Mabdi Messi, avec 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 le professeur um, Alisa qui déjà fait un gros travail surtout dans la question de de histoire dans la partie ça qui est très important. I would like to say thank you thank you to professor Alisa who already did some great work on introducing the history of this conversation. Et professeur Jean Jean Edi tout qui qui fait un gros travail tout surtout dans ça qui ouais avec qui avec on capable de partir sociologique académique question hein, pour nous garder. And a thank you to um, Professor Jean Eddy about the um, his sociological contributions to the conversation. Et toute question professeur Selelio qui est très fondamentale tout temps nous pas une réponse question ça yo 
presque tout travail qui a fait au point de vue académique pour essayer de jouer une réponse plus durable pour jean pays en quoi Haïti ça. Si tu une réponse, on ne pas sortir. Qui est-ce qui a fait Qui est-ce qui, qui a dirigé ça Qui est-ce qui, qui, est qui contrôle tout le monde Ça, c'est des questions pour nous, jouer une réponse pour eux. And of course, um, the questions posed by Professor Céline, if we do not find the answers to her questions, uh, we will never get out of the situation. Who are the actors? Who is directing the conversation? Who's directing the work? Who's controlling everything? These are essential. Même si ces paroles que nous avons là, c'est surtout qui rôle haïtien a joué dans la crise politique là et la crise humanitaire dans le pays là dans le pays d'Haïti, qui a une histoire qui est presque allée au-delà de 200 ans. Et Haïti n'a pas jamais pris un break, mais nous-mêmes, je parle de société civile là. Et nous avons les bénéficiaires qui sont supposés être eux-mêmes qui sont les premiers acteurs. C'est surtout de eux-mêmes que je vais parler. Um, the little contribution I am going to make is what role are Haitians playing in the humanitarian and political crisis? We can say since 200 years, Haiti has never had a break. And we, the civil society, we who are often called beneficiaries, um, we are the main actors in this situation. There is a qui that I have pour ça qui ouais avec crise politique on croit professeur ça fait un bon travail même pas presque touché parce que c'est pas grand rien qui changer dans relation Haïti et toute relation diplomatique li avec de l'autre pays c'est même bagaille qui bail même résultat so pas gain pas gain miracle dans ça c'est même même comportement yo et qui bail même résultat dans vivre là et tout le monde connaît ça n'est pas un secret pour personne There are a lot of lessons um, that we've learned with the political crisis that the others have touched on. I won't go back into this because essentially nothing has changed with the diplomatic relations between Haiti and other countries and centuries. There have been no miracles. There's been no widespread change. So I'm not going to go into that right now. Et j'en ai toujours dit, le monde utilise le mot résilience pour lui. Son père et même père utilise le mot ça parce que vient trois résilience et ou, ou vient accepter tout le bagage. Mais son père qui était plus ou moins bouger le pays. A. Et c'est nous qui avons bougé le pays a, de côté de rivière là. Mais la crise politique là, il fait quelqu'un sous nous. Et ma petite crise politique avec relation internationale, c'est lui même qui a des ans par un peuple ici. Mais peuple ici, pour qu'on son peuple qui est très fort et nous montrer ça. Parce que c'est déjà plus. Um, I'm going to talk about the effect that the political crisis has on the life of everyday Haitians. The Haitian people, everyone likes to call us resilient, but I do not like using this word because there's a fine line between resilience and resignation. Um, but we are the ones who every day are making this country move forward. But the effect of the political crisis on us, it's disempowering us. We are strong, but it's been more than 200 years of disempowerment for us as Haitian people. Et il y a des choses nous toujours dit, nous, oui, et depuis un bon moment, Haïti a seulement besoin d'un exemple pour lever le camp. Et c'est exemple ça nous cherché qui nous pas jamais qu'à faire, nous pas jamais qu'à joindre. Et en 2004, il y a un cyclone, ce cyclone Jeanne, qui passe et qui ravageait, et qui ravageait Gonaïve. Et tout le monde a pensé, OK, nous prenons prend Gonaïve comme un exemple pour nous reconstruire et pour respecter à capable de au moins côté dans faire. Et franchement, Gonaïve vient plus mal que Jeanne le dit. One of the things that we have that Haiti just needs an example to rise up, but we can't seem to find that example. In 2004, we had Cyclone Jean that hit Gonaïve, the city of Gonaïve. Everyone said we will use this as an example to do things different, to do things better. And yet today, Gonaïve is worse than it was when it was hit by Cyclone Jean. I'm sorry, 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 I'm en Haïti. Et, et puis, même avant 2010, ça nous prend 2004. 2004, nous avons une crise politique là, qui pourrait tomber sous crise humanitaire, toute qualité de crise. Et nous avons une nation unie. L'autre des nations unies, par rapport à ce qui est écrit dans le chat là, c'est le monde qui mettait ensemble pour venir de résoudre le problème là, Kayo. Et franchement, 14 ans plus tard, les Nations Unies pourraient quitter Haïti. Les quitter Haïti sont Haïti, nous n'avons pas de jambes qui ont avant. Même avant l'indépendance, nous n'avons pas de pays qui ont aussi 
armé comme ça, avec toute gang ça yo, et qui aussi pauvre comme ça, avec plus passé 3 points à 4 millions de monde qui pas même capable de manger en peine en jour. Ça veut dire, relation nous avec le reste monde là, il est vraiment il pas aller profitable pour Aïssa. Um, and we can go back to the earthquake in 2010 and even before that in 2004, after the political crisis um, with the UN um, stabilization mission MINUSTA that came in, which when you said the United Nations, that's the world that puts itself together to try to resolve your problems. Um, but 14 years later, they left us in a state that was worse off than when they came. We are more armed than we were. We are poorer than we were with 3.4 million people in food insecurity. So this, this history keeps repeating itself. En 2010, les mêmes c'est gestion, l'autre catastrophe en dedans, catastrophe, c'est le monde l'a débarqué et franchement c'est tout partout dans le monde là où on a prié pour Haïti, mobiliser un paquet d'argent, bien promettre un paquet d'argent parce qu'il y a un peu de monde qui pense que problème Haïti a assez l'argent qui a résolu et finalement là encore, nous montrer nous échouer pirette. And then in 2010, again, we were going back to the catastrophe and a catastrophe, the earthquake that came. People were crying and felt bad for Haiti, and they promised a lot of money, thinking that it would be money that would solve Haiti's problems. But again, we find that that's not the answer, and, and we are in a worse state than we were before. So, I'm going to tell you this story, it's just to be able to make a relationship. A relationship that you have, what happened before you, we talked about 2004, we talked about 2004, we talked about Cyclone Jeanne, problem politics, and it was 2010. All that, honestly, it's international that came to you to make a relationship. Haïtien juste rete chita en battante, rete pour nous attendre aide. Ça moi ce différent qui fait là, qui m'ta rien main pour pour que moun ki nan domaine académique pour ton attention en plus. C'est après 14 d'août là, c'est mobilisation haïtien pour yo aller de grand sud là avec minimum que yo gagne. Um, so I can cite this history because we need to talk about what happened before the political problems, the earthquake, the hurricanes, and after all these things, the commonalities that the internationals came in and did what they wanted to do. Haitians were perceived as just sitting under tents and waiting for aid. But what has been particularly visible and what academics and others can focus on is that for this, these catastrophes on the 14th of August, we need to look at the mobilization of Haitians, everyday Haitians towards um, the, grand, the Grand South um, and to see what they could do to sell, support their, their to support the affected areas in solidarity. So, mais via avec problème qui existe dans organisation l'État même qui t'a supposé à by directive avec l'aide humanitaire ou bien puis bien former population pour qu'on ait comment pour y aider. C'est comme si même toute énergie ça nous est sorti en dans tout pays à l'ivine l'Iran grand sud la presque même plus des empereurs que j'en étais avant parce que pas un canal qui a coordonné comme si vouloir volonté ça que peut pas y s'engager ça veut dire là encore nous venons tourner sur problème politique crise politique et problème gouvernance dans le pays d'Haïti um, but because of the problems of the state which is supposed to give directives and coordination for humanitarian aid even all of that energy that's come from across the civil society of the country it might end up disempowering people in the grand south because there is no way to coordinate and convene the will of even the Haitian people. And so we might end up disempowering the Grand South and leaving them worse off than before. Um, when I say that, I would say that the population, we have a lot of courage, we are always ready to help each other. But what does it do? The state exists in all the world. It's not that we have two problems, even if we have made a combat, we have made a fight for us to resolve two problems. Mais il y a des problèmes qui ont toujours arrivé au, au niveau de l'État. Je prends un exemple. Par exemple, nous avons environ 514 écoles dans le Grand Sud là, qui, qui frappaient par tremblement de terre. Et dans ça, il y a 114 qui sont complètement détruits. Et l'école qui a supposé ouvrir les quatre, jusqu'à présent, l'État n'a pas même en mesure pour lui dire qu'on sait, OK, mais on chèque qu'il baille en l'école pour que tout le monde l'école. Et tout le monde doit être basé d'éducation. Population, a, moun yon kapap pote de l'eau bay moun, kapap pote manje bay moun. Men lor yon venan gwo infrastructure sa yo, la ou bezwen présence l'État. Et même la, ou même l'État mobilise, gen environ 38 partenaire, plus que 20 ONG ki mobilise nan gran sud la, la nou pou ka un résultat toujou. Et dernier note ki sorti de, 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 de PC, fe konne se selman 10% couverture, yon rive jwenn avec assistance humanitaire. Et lor pale de couverture sa anko ki couverture liye, 
c'est peut-être pour te manger, pour moun boter de l'eau, pour moun pas gagner rien de concret. And I say this, you know, we, we need the population. And yes, we as a population, we have courage, we help each other with the spirit of combat. But there's a reason we have a state and that these issues go back to governance. There are, let me give you an example. There are 514 schools that were affected by, um, by the natural disaster, um, 114 destroyed. Schools should be opening soon, but the state doesn't really have a plan for that. Um, the population, we can bring water, we can bring food, we can bring solidarity, but there are things that the state needs to resolve um, and there are bigger partners that the state needs to coordinate. And the DPC, which is the State Disaster Management Agency, only has 10% coverage in terms of the humanitarian activities that have been out there today. Et je pense que je vous dis avec Haïti, parce que même si mon tas dit Haïti sont laboratoires à petit déjeuner, mais soit petit déjeuner, il faut qu'il y ait des bagages qui sortent, qui sont capables, pas grand qui sortent même, ça veut dire même étudier. Et je pense qu'il y a un peu de poussé qui est académique, qui est un peu créatif, qui est activiste, qui est un peu de c'est aider Haïti à aller plus concret que possible. Par exemple, moi, je vais paquet cob qui a ba en Haïti mais qu'aime casser chaque les ou t'a dit en tant qu'on haïtien les moi gagne on on 2 3 millions on 20 millions qui débloqué sur Haïti me ta compte mais me plus peur les ou les ou pour mettre Haïti cob les pas le ba Haïti cob me plus peur pour Haïti ça veut dire question des notions de l'argent c'est lui même qui engendre la corruption en Haïti donc quoi plus gros plaidoirie pour nous ta faire journée aujourd'hui à c'est ba cob là pour qui ça est parler exactement par exemple nous gagne 140 140 114 l'école qui crase complètement si chaque l'école ça par exemple a coûté 500 millions 500 000 dollars 1 million de dollars que nous connait comme ça pour reconstruire l'école là et là encore nous capable créer job parce que yo n'a pas bon monde regarder haïtien humanitaire yo habitué avec haïtien pour au prince yo yo pas habitué avec haïtien haïtien pas un peuple qui remet même on a bali et c'est ça qui arrive dans grand sud là la majorité monde qui a formé quand dans le grand studio, ce sont des gens qui sont dans des autres villes dans le pays, qui sont dans Port-au-Prince. Mais vrai, les gens qui sont dans la caillou parce qu'ils ne sont pas habitués avec ça. Et je vous dis, après, il y a qui pour faire, c'est vraiment aider Haïti dans la question des infrastructures. Route, l'école, l'université, le centre professionnel, c'est là que nous avons besoin de Mais nous ne pouvons pas de l'eau manger encore parce que les Haïtiens qui ont aidé l'autre Haïtien à manger avec l'eau. Et vous montrez montrer ça dans le grand studio. I think today in Haiti, you know, Haiti feels like a laboratory and there's when we need to be learning and all the studies are coming out. But what we need to be focusing more is being more concrete. Because to be honest, as a Haitian, every time money is released for Haiti, 20 million, 30 million dollars, I get scared because the money leads to corruption. So the advocacy, we need to be talking about money for what? If each of those 114 schools that were destroyed, the funds can be used to rebuild those schools. That's something concrete. That's something that can create jobs. Humanitarians are too used to working with Haitians in Port-au-Prince, but people in the countryside, they are different. Uh, they need infrastructure, they need roads. They don't need water and food. We can cover that ourselves. We can give that to each other. But there's another level at which things need to work on, uh, operate on, uh, uh, that we need to be investing in. Et Jusqu'à présent, après trois semaines, nous pouvons arriver pour nous faire comme ça. Pour qui ça? Parce que nous avons un minimum de plans, nous avons un minimum de façon pour nous sélectionner les groupes. Pour ça, nous avons un monde qui est vraiment vulnérable. Mais ça fait l'argent dépenser avec facilité comme ça dans le pays, parce que nous ne pouvons pas prendre l'argent. Parce que jour après, nous avons un bagage, l'argent ne pas dépenser facile comme ça. Parce que l'argent a un bagage, il est café et nous avons un peu de l'argent. I'm going to stop here soon because I know my time is up and that uh, Emmanuel is going to speak to a lot of this because she's working on making a model in the South. Um, but I just want to emphasize, it's the fact that there's no plan in the country. That's why money flows so freely. Um, even on a small level, friends of mine, we gathered about $9,000 to support work in the Grand South, but we haven't even dispersed that money yet because we have a minimum of plans, a minimum of standards that we're trying to put in place for this. So once we have a plan, the money might slow down, but it'll go to a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you for this space and looking forward for questions and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Merci Ampio, merci Robilla. 
Uh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, this, this was a wonderful presentation uh, and especially focusing at least from the point of view, my point of view of the vicious and recurrent repetition of history, a history of disempowerment and the challenge that we have to revert that disempowerment and start a new history of empowerment of the Haitian people. Thank you very much, uh, Messi and Pia. And now finally, we have the, the last speaker today, uh, Manuela Duyon. Uh, the mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this panel and share my view on the path to achieve a stable future for Haiti. And I want to thank the fellow panelists for, for the input. Um, I'll be speaking based on my experience as a Haitian citizen, activist, and specialist in development policies and projects. And in my point of view, to better plan the future, we must learn the lessons from the past and develop a clear understanding of the present. Haiti is rich in history. The present in Haiti is really complicated but we definitely need to keep looking back to what happened in the past and try to learn from it and develop a better comprehension of what is happening on the ground. And when we observe the situation in Haiti, it seems like we are trapped. History keeps repeating itself and we are caught in a vicious cycle. And what's happening now is a really good illustration what's happening and how could this impact the future there is a multifaceted crisis in haiti right now on the political level we observe a political deadlock a vacuum in power following the assassination of former president Jovenel Moïse, difficulty among key political actors and civil society to to reach a large consensus and solve the crisis and also the economy is suffering from three consecutive years of negative economic growth. And other aspects that we need to take into account include insecurity, gang violence, a humanitarian crisis following the displacement of people fleeing gang violence is multi an increase in the number of people in food and security and also the recent earthquake, the 7.2 magnitude earthquake, which devastated the southern southwestern part of the country. And taking this situation into account, what's the path to achieve a stable future? I'll start by repeating what I said at the beginning, we must learn the lessons from the past. It is very, very important. And it's also because from my experience, people keep doing the same thing and they are expecting different results. What I'm witnessing is that people are doing what they've been doing for years, not only Haitians, people in the international communities as well. No one is willing to, to, to be innovative. No one is willing to question the approach in Haiti and, and really bring, try something new. I think we must dare innovate and use different approach. And talking about lessons, I think we need to understand that political crises in Haiti are not inevitable. We must prevent them, stop them. And also we must ensure that we do not create conditions for the emergence of new crises. For example, we know that bad elections always lead to crisis in Haiti. Therefore, we should never wish to have new election just because we want to maintain democracy. Democracy is, is not only about elections. And if we wish election, we are going to maintain the cycle. We will have the same kind of crisis we've always had. And the, the worst is that those actors, they are used to it. They know how to start crisis and they know how to maintain them because some people at the end of the day, some people are like professional of crisis. They make the living out of it. And if we keep doing the same thing, then we will perpetrate this cycle. We will keep having this vicious cycle. For years, 
we have witnessed like state capture in Haiti. Politicians in power, they have been making choices that promote their own interests and that are detrimental to the economy. We will need to put the country's interests forward and have a clear plan for the economy, for the country in general, but for the economy as well. And the best plans will fail if the level of insecurity and gang violence remains the same. We need to restore peace and stability. Not only restore it, we need to maintain it too. We've had operations in the past where we tackled gang violence for a few months and we went back to it. We had minister in Haiti, we had peace for a few months and it get worse afterward. We need to think more in long-term and how we will have peace, stability and maintain it. And one of the biggest positive changes that occurred in Haiti for the past few years is the broad movement for accountability called the Petro Challenge. The demands for accountability are not addressed, unfortunately, despite the, despite the large protest movement. Moving forward, we will need to put accountability at the heart of governance in Haiti. It's about time that people are held accountable. Impunity is another reason why we have the same kind of leaders that we are dealing with the same problems in Haiti because justice is rarely done, justice is not done and individuals who perpetrate all kinds of crimes, they are free to enjoy their life, run for office and destabilize the country if they want. And they usually do. And last but not the least, we need to develop better relationship with partners in other countries we need to have more win-win cooperation, more ambitious goals instead of the typical traditional foreign interference. And thank you for having me. And I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Emanuela, for this wonderful presentation and this reflection on how we need to look at history, not only as telling the past, but basically as lessons to learn from the past and to not repeat in the present as we move on to, you know, to a better future for Haiti. And I forgot to mention before Sabina Robilla, thank you very much for helping us with the translation of the presentation of Monsieur Robilla in, in, um, <clears throat> in Creole. Thank you, thank you very much, Sabina. And now I, it is my pleasure to give him <clears throat> the microphone to my dear colleague and friend, uh, Professor Love. I'm sorry, we, we're having some, okay. And she's going, to, she's going to make some comments, critical comments on this, and she will also direct the, the Q&A session. Welcome again, uh, uh, Marian, uh, Professor Love, and. The, the mic is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much, Diego. And uh, as Diego said, yes, my name is Miriam Dolor. I'm a professor of uh, international affairs at the Elliott School and director of the Humanitarian Action Initiative. And it is such a pleasure to be here. Uh, this panel has been absolutely incredible. I think that all of the guests brought unique perspectives, yet provided a very rich fabric of uh, a foundation for discussion, but also a very rich understanding of the past and present uh, and, and possible future uh, situation in Haiti. So thank you very much uh, for these really insightful comments. Uh, my job here is just to provide a very brief summary. I'd like to mostly hand it over to the audience members for questions. Uh, please use the Q&A uh, feature uh, to submit questions. We also do have um, a, a few questions there already. And uh, so I will go ahead and ask those, but just to sum up uh, what we've just heard. So again, a very rich perspective on Haiti from the historical, economic, sociological, political dimensions to the activity of grassroots movements and social movements on the ground, as well as these bottom-up movements to try to improve governance. One of the themes that all, all every single panelist referred to is these kind of different iterations of colonialism that have shaped the history and, and the present of Haiti. So from you know, colonialism 
by the French and the Spanish to this, you know, more indirect uh, colonialism via US foreign policy to neocolonialism of uh, NGOs, uh, uh, non-governmental organizations, international organizations, and the UN via international interventions and humanitarian interventions. And the deep imprint this has had on the trajectory of, uh, of Haiti. The panelists also all agreed that the biggest stumbling block is the Haitian state itself in terms of you have these uh, very active bottom up movements that Roby and um, Emanuela have described. You have these external interventions via international organizations, but a lot of that momentum and energy is stilted by the, uh, the instability within the political system itself and characterized by corruption, uh, a lack of accountability and impunity, a uh, lack of uh, justice. So this leads to this vicious cycle. And I, I think uh, we purposely ended on Emanuela because we know that she's been working on these kind of future looking um, initiatives. And uh, while many of the panelists talked about the vicious cycle, she talks about how we might break it. And I think this is the question that I have, right? How do we break this vicious cycle? And this applies not only to Haiti, but so many uh, places where we have protracted crises and protracted emergencies. How do we break these very deep seated uh, political and social situations? How do we break these vicious cycles? And Emanuela offers um, a few options and and many of these were echoed by all of the panelists so question the approaches right jean edi and Alyssa were talking about the imaginaries we have about humanitarian action how do we question those imaginaries what do we how do we question the narratives uh cecile was asking right how do we question uh the uh intersectionality are we are our approaches intersectional? Are our approaches um, thinking about positionality? How do we innovate? And then a key point that came out is that uh, humanitarian action itself is not enough, right? That we need to address peace and stability. We need to think about development. I think someone used the word nexus. This is a very loaded term, but it's basically talking about the policy nexus between development and humanitarian action. So I, I just wanted to kind of draw some of these themes uh, across the panelists and then open it up to uh, questions. We have many. If the panelists are okay, what I'll do is ask, uh, the. we have three questions in the queue right now. I'll ask these three questions and then you can uh, just take turns uh, responding if that's okay. Okay, so first three questions. Uh, the first is by, uh, it's either Jan or Jan Lewis. In absence of the state, can the commission to search for a Haitian solution take charge of organizing response to the needs in the Grand South? And the second question, I'll just take two because now I see that we have four. So I'll take two for the first two. Second uh, uh, question is what about the lawlessness Reports that Haitian hosts are being kidnapped after guests leave, presumably to obtain ransom money. So I don't know if there's uh, any panelists that would like to address those two questions. Yeah, Maria, Maria. Yes. Maria. So if my colleagues um, agree, I can pick the. I can start with answering, trying to answer the first question that deals with the civil society and the state. Sure. Okay. So um, I think um, a couple of things that I would like to I'd like to have a to answer that question is like uh, when we are talking about uh, the uh, building process of uh, the um, democracy of citizenship, for instance, in two thousand and four. So I'm gi giving more an academic uh, um, answer to understand that in 2004, the United Nations uh, um, Development Program, the UNDP, published in, I, at least I, I read that in Spanish, a very important report uh, published in Spanish entitled La Democracia en America, Democracia de Ciudadanías y de Ciudadanos. That is, democracy in America toward a democracy for citizenship. And when we are talking about citizenship, 
at least there are two important components, two important components. The state and the civil society. Civil society cannot replace the state. So despite the fact that we are dealing with globalization, but the state is still the state. So we need a state. And what is the state is an articulation of social relation. So, and all of my colleagues, uh, actually they articulate what Haitian people want. Haitian people need a different kind of state because historically Haiti has had a state in which we have observed a disconnection between the state and the community of the citizen. So there has been that disconnection. So people are fighting for reimagining the state in Haiti because historically the state has been imagined by the Haitian elite and those Haitian elite, they never had a connection with the masses of the population. So, and I think that is very important to recuperate and fight for the state. And we can, we can have really a state for the citizenship. If, for instance, when we will have election, there are certain conditions or preconditions that are created. For instance, now, uh, we have gang violence in Haiti, but Haiti, we don't, we don't manufacture guns. We don't manufacture guns in Haiti. So it's also the responsibility of the international community as for instance, recently um, uh, um, Congressman Gregory Mix, um, he was uh, you know, hosting like a hearing in the Congress on Haiti and he said that the US should stop the flow, the flow of guns in Haiti. We need a new kind of policies of the international community Canada and more specifically the US when it comes to you know, illegal guns that are the hand of the gangster in Haiti. This is something that is important. We cannot have election if we have a situation of the gangsterization of the country. But the international community, they can do something if they want to pacify the country, right? I don't like the concept of stabilization because it's very a new or positive concept, but they can do that. But it's very important we can change. Haitian people are asking for a change of the social relation to have a new prototypes of state. This is important. Second thing, city, uh, um, the civil society. We also have to understand that Haitian people, they are very critical against what, for instance, I, I have for in my research, but many of those research I, are published in Spanish, but what a difference uh, between the so civil society from below and so civil society from, from the up. So I think that the um, civil society that we have now in Haiti, La, um, uh, La, so La Société Civile pour une recherche à la so Société Civile Haitienne, uh, Haitian civil society for in, a local solution to the Haitian crisis, I myself, I think is a good idea, but personally, I don't think that this is a kind of civil society that is really, really well connected to the masses of the population. Because what happened in Haiti is uh, generally politics has been played and operates in the Republic of Port-au-Prince. Now that Republic of Port-au-Prince has been modified by the Republic of Pétionville. So if we analyze, because as a sociologist, I took a look to the social relation, Many of most of those meetings happen in very luxurious hotel located in Pétionville, in uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I am asking, where is the voice of les paysans, the people we call the paysans de yor? So I didn't see at now that strong articulation, a civil society that can articulate both the reivindication of the people in the you know, inner city to the reivindication, the claim of the people outside the Republic of Puerto Rico. So in closing, I think it's important to recuperate, to change the social relation, but to have a state. Because until now, we still need the state. And the state will need a civil society that can serve as check and balance, you know, balance of power to serve as vigilantes, but not using vigilantes in the center of the US, 
to check out on the government. But we need the state. We cannot substitute the state for civil society. And if we are trying to strengthen in civil society, we have to make sure that that civil society is the representation of what we call in sociology, la conscience collective, the collective consciousness that includes the masses of the population and those people that have been historically marginalized because they are not part of the Republic of Puerto Rico. Thank you so much, jean -Ledi. So you, you sort of answered both of the, the first two questions. So I will um, move down the list and then as uh, other panelists take the mic, they can also refer to those first two questions. The next question we have is from Robert McGuire and it's for Emanuela. Um, he says, yes, doing something to reinforce accountability is essential. Impunity has been Haiti's scrouge since the fall of Duvalier. What specific ideas of what can be done can you share with us? And this also links to the previous question about lawlessness, I think. So Emanuela, and if anyone else uh, ha has uh, an answer, I think you could you know, maybe raise your hand and then I would know to call on you. Thank you, Professor McGuire. And there are like many things that could be done. I'll start with a, a trial, a corruption trial. Corrupt, like corrupt, one of the problem when we talk about accountability in Haiti is because we have so many corrupt officials. And if we want to address this problem, we need to address corruption. And talking about corruption, like Leslie Payan, who is the Haitian authors who made the most, like who work on corruption a lot, like from an academic point of view on the econ political economy of corruption. And from his work, he stated that corruption goes back to the colonial period, so even before our independence. And when you consider this from that period to today, there hasn't been any huge cases where justice was done, where corrupt people went to jail, when we recuperated the money. It never happened. We had a trial on 1904 the uh, huge trial against corruption, but the people who were condemned in this trial became head of state afterwards. And we're living with this. So people like me, like all Haitian, we know that you do whatever you want. You still state money. Nothing will happen to you if you, have, if you are powerful enough to buy the people in the judiciary system. And if we want really to have accountability, we need to start fighting impunity. People will, like for example, for the past three years, we've been asking for the Petro Caribe trial. The Petro Caribe scandal is the largest financial corruption scandal in Haiti for the past 50 years. And if we start there, we can send a clear signal that something can be done against you if you are involved in corruption. Otherwise, impunity will still prevail and people won't be held accountable. Some another, I work on the annual corruption report, the first of its kind in Haiti this year. It's going to be published soon. And what we realize is that Haitian officials are supposed to publish their assets they need to declare the asset. It's a rule, it's in the law, but they don't do it. They are minister and they, they, they are like in power and they don't do it. And people who are supposed to enforce this just complain on the radio sometimes and nothing happened. They need to start respecting the rule. For example, this rule, if you are an official, you need to declare your asset. And also there is a court of auditors in Haiti and this court is supposed to give discharge to people who have been managing the state money, who have been ruling, who have been managing some office. But they, this is usually not the case. And even in some cases where the court audited the administration of some key officials and they found them that they didn't, they mismanaged the money, those people still go to the Supreme Court and then they cancel those accusations and they go back to office. And recently, a few months ago, one of the last scandalous act that former President Jovenel Moïse did is to give discharge to so many people. 
and we were managing money. This is like totally wrong. This is exactly what we do not want if we want more accountability. Therefore, we need to inf reinforce this, that when someone has been managing the state money or has been in office, there doesn't need to be an audit of his management. And that person need to either have a key to, so how we call it in French, or face charge for mismanagement. And I think that if we start with those three things at least, have people declare their assets, have the court of auditors audit the management and have a trial, a real trial, one that will stay in history where we know that those people who mismanage the petro money, the fund that was supposed to finance development project face charge for this. And, and they can't run for office again, then this will send a clear signal. And two questions were asked before. I just wanted to ask someone asked whether the commission to search for a Haitian solution could intervene in the South because the state isn't doing anything. Unfortunately, people are more like they are busy fighting for power. Now, when I say people, the, the people in the government, people in the government, they are busy fighting for power and they are not paying attention to the South. Haitian citizen, including we know myself and many other people, we are trying to help. And this is what happened in civil society is replacing the state, but it's not something we should encourage. And I think Professor Paul Eddy talked about it. There is a tendency to replace the state in Haiti. No electricity, we buy our, our own generator, no healthcare, we have private doctor, and we, we keep replacing the state. The commission to search for Haitian solution is already doing a great job trying to solve the governance problem, to fill the vacuum in power because after the assassination of Jovenel Moïse, and it's already very difficult. And I don't think they can handle response to the South, and, but I think that they should instead try to finalize the process. I know it's really hard. I know how difficult it is. We want them to finalize it so we can have a legitimate transitional government and this transitional government will handle, will handle the response to the South. And about lawlessness, this is a very sad situation. Unfortunately, most Haitians now function with the idea that they can be kidnapped anytime. It's really not safe on the street in Haiti. And, it, and the gangs are so powerful. It's, it's profits the people who, are, who have strong ties to the gang and everyone else is a prey. You can be kidnapped anytime. You can lose everything you've worked hard for like in one second because you have to pay ransom. And it's a very sad situation. And it's all imbricated and we won't be able to solve it if there are not, uh, there is no political will. We, if we do not have people in power, we really want to tackle those issues and restore security in the country. Thank you so much, Emanuela. So we're kind of coming up on time here. We still have a few questions. So here's what I suggest. Cecile needs to leave uh, exactly at 1.30. So I will uh, pass the mic to her if she'd like to answer any of these uh, remaining questions that I'll ask in a minute. Then we can move to Alyssa and Roby since they haven't spoken uh, yet in this in this last round uh, with uh, you know trying to still end at 1.30. So the outstanding questions we have is one um, from uh, Patricia Aserbi who asks uh, if the panelists could speak to the conditions on the border with the Dominican Republic. We have another question from Ashley Piamonti who uh, asks about organizations like the USAID and whether they uh, can engage to su support positive change in Haiti in a way that is conscious of the problematic US history and centralizes Haitian rather than external priorities, or should they just not be involved? Uh, and a final question uh, was asking about the movement coming to pressure France into returning the independence tax. A few writers have advocated for this in France's record in teaching Haitian history is spotty at best, meaning they'd be reluctant. So Cecile, I know you have to go, so I'll hand it over to you. And then if Alyssa and Roby want to chime in right after her, please. 
Yeah, um, thank you so much, Mariam. Yeah, I started answer, answering um, Ashley Pinamonti's question. So for me, I think um, USAID is not going to disappear. Even if they weren't there officially, they're going to be there in some other form. I think part of the um, challenge, and I've been in close contact with people who have worked for USAID, is I think there needs to be more intersectionality and more transparency, who gets the contract? Like USAID has become not only are they centralized in Port-au-Prince um, for the most part, but also it's they're working too closely with the 2% who's already have access to the country. So there needs to be some real conversation, some real openness and transparency regarding um, USA, USA ID and how are they working with real grassroots organizations? But again, as Emmanuel mentioned, it's this um, delicate balance because part of the challenge that Haiti was called the Republic of NGOs is that um, the, the, the state is not doing anything. So the NGOs take over. So how do you have that balance? I don't know. And for state, I mean, for the question on the DR in Haiti, I sent a link to a documentary, Wonderful State, led by Michelle. Um, what's Michelle's last name? She's a wonderful filmmaker. Stevenson. Thank you, everyone. I apologize that I have to go. <laughs> Good seeing you all. Merci en pile, tout le monde. Thank you. Um, Sabina, are you there? Yes. All right, okay. I can go in quicker. Um, so, I'm going to take a little bit because I'm going to get a little bit. The question is, there is a good civil society that can remplace the state or not remplace the state. I don't think it's the case. We don't need to remplace the state. Au contraire, et dans le bon terme, non, oui, nous avons besoin de remplacer l'État, mais son l'État, ce n'est pas un groupe qui peut aller travailler l'État pour l'État. Par exemple, je vous dis, Haïti a supposé qu'il y a plus de 500 personnes qui sont élus, qui ont dirigé. Nous avons seulement 10 personnes seulement. Ça veut dire que nous avons un bon lèvre vraiment pour vraiment avoir un bon chita et repenser l'État, refondre l'État qui peut servir Haïti. Donc, je vais aller vite parce que nous sommes à temps time Let's, i want to talk about the question about having a better civil society we don't need civil society to replace the state we need a better state um today haiti sh ha should have more than 500 elected officials but there's we i think right now only 10 people who have actually have a mandate so we're actually in a good position now to be rethinking what the state is and how it functions in the country et acteurs internationaux. Pour nous tout entrer l'autre question qui était gagnée, est-ce que nous avons besoin de camper avec ISAID ou bien avec agences internationales? Nous ne sommes pas capables. Pas un pays dans le monde là qu'on a qui fonctionner sans support de l'autre pays. Ça nous capable de demander aussi, qui bien tendre à Haïti ou bien qui bien apprendre des leçons qui apprennent. Par exemple, nous avons besoin de créer un État. Nous connaissons vraiment parler de démocratie, démocratie. J'ai émané la tête de la démocratie, ce n'est pas élection, Dieu seulement. Élections, c'est des Nous Oh, it looks like we lost Rippy. Sorry. Um, so I'll, I'll just summarize what he said so far. Um, and, and for this to rethink the state, you know, we need the support. We, we do need the support of international actors, but just in a different way. Um, because in this modern world, no one can work without international partners and cooperation. That's not the way the world works anymore. But we need them to listen to us. Um, we need to build a state and people speak about democracy. But as Emanuela said, 
elections are not democracy. Democracy is more than that. Um, and that's when we started to lose Roby a little bit. But I think there was a bit where he was saying about, you know, if people are not in security, if they cannot eat, you know, is that democracy? Can you build a democracy on that? And that's, I think, an open question and about where I lost him. <laughs> and sh should I just chime in very quickly? We're at 1032, but on the USAID question. So one thing I'll say, and again, my subject position is as an American who doesn't have roots in Haiti, but like other American citizens, wants to know if our country wants to help Haiti, what is really helping, right? What is real aid? So um, one thing, as my colleagues have said, um, and you can see that there's incredible expertise and energy among Haitians. So the days when NGOs paid foreign workers to come in and study the problem and implement things without Haitians, that those days have to be over. As Emanuela said, doing the same thing in the past and expecting different results has to end. So all things that the international community does that are supposed to bring stability and help Haiti need to be done in partnership with Haitian professionals and Haitian activists and Haitian civil society leaders. And as Cecile said, not just the 2%. So USAID, for instance, um, building factories in the north of Haiti, like in Caracol, which maybe some Haitian factory owners thought was a great idea, but which displaced farmers and caused environmental pollution um, and led to people working for horrible wages. This has all been documented. That is not what Haitians want to see from USAID or other NGOs. They want to see them working in genuine partnership. And I'm just going to drop in the chat, um, the URL for an op-ed that I wrote along with Emanuela emphasizing this, that NGOs really have to work in partnership with Haitians in order to have different results. Wonderful, thank you so much. We're sort of on time, so this is perfect. Uh, we are at time. I'd like to thank all of our panelists. I'd like to thank Rihanna Doyle for her really hard work behind the scenes, coordinating everything, communicating with all the panelists, making sure that we were a go for today. Thank you so much. And also thank you to Diego for um, going along with uh, the <laughs> this project and being so helpful and recruiting panelists and, and being such a wonderful host. Thank you, everyone. We have recorded the session. We will make that available to anyone that registered. Um, that will probably be available on the Elliott School YouTube uh, channel station. So we'll send out that link. And thank you once again to all the panelists. This was such a, uh, a rich discussion. And I, I, I hope we're going to move the needle a little bit in terms of the policy world. So thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much to all. Thank you. Thank you. Merci on peel tout moon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.